Behind me is Sydney Harbour. Into this harbour came Japanese submarines during the dark days of the Second World War. It appeared quite likely that Australia would fall to the invading Japanese forces. But thanks be to God, America came to the aid of the land down under. And that is why here in Australia, people love the Americans. We will never, never forget how America came to our aid during our time of crisis. I'm John Carter in Sydney, Australia, and welcome today to the Carter Report. My topic today is the truth that saves. And before I bring this presentation to you, we have another presentation. I want you to welcome today my wife, Beverly. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever is happening to good manners? Someone said that the test of good manners is to be able to put up with bad ones. The American Dictionary's definition of manners is the socially correct way of acting or behaving. It seems as if a lot of people don't read dictionaries anymore. For example, the elderly lady waiting at the pedestrian crossing and none of the cars will stop. People who don't say please when they ask you for something and then they forget to say thank you when you give it to them. Did you know that in some circles today it is considered politically incorrect to give up a seat to a woman on a, a bus or a train? Something about equality. These people don't seem to know that in God's sight men and women are of equal importance. But we're somewhat different in many ways. But I, for one, like the results of these differences, like a man opening a door for me or giving up his seat if there's no others available. We call it good manners. Then we have the latest invention, the cell phone. Someone needs to quickly write an etiquette book on how to use this invention in public. Don't you just love listening to all the family or office gossip in the booth next door in the restaurant? It's the best reality show in town, but I think for most of us, we could well do without it. And please, let's leave our cell phones at home when we go to a concert, a funeral, a wedding, or a church service, and especially the latter, the Sabbath is a day of rest. Let's give our cell phones a rest too. How do you and I rate on good manners? One good standard to judge our manners by, and especially here in Southern California, is how do we act or react on the freeways? What do we do when someone cuts in front of us in a dangerous manner? Road rage is not the answer because now we have two dangerous drivers on the road. Mind you, I have often thought I would like to place a big foghorn, you know, like they have on ocean liners on the top of my car and blow it at the appropriate time. However, as I think about it, it's probably not a good idea. Law enforcement tells us the best thing to do is to take a deep breath and relax, and I'm sure they're right. Good manners are best learned by children observing well-mannered parents. Besides learning thank you, please, excuse me, etc., another very important aspect of good manners is being taught how to deal with a disagreement or conflict. If a boy sees his father bullying his mother or vice versa, there's a chance that boy will become a bully too. Also, when he grows up and gets married, he, in turn, could bully his wife. 
We need to role model to our children the importance of showing respect and courtesy even when we disagree. This respect and courtesy helps to build a positive moral climate both in the home and community. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Today we have to contend with the evil of vulgarity and profanity found in many rap songs, television programs, and movies. And parents need to be vigilant at all times. In 1 Peter 3, 8, we read, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion towards each other, love as brethren, be kind and courteous. This verse is a great recipe for a peaceful home, a peaceful church, a peaceful community, and a peaceful world. Can you please take out your Bibles? Can you hold them up? Can you say these words, which these words are a part of our meetings? This is my Bible. This is, my Bible. This is God's Word. This is God's Word. God, has God has a message for me today. His message will give me everlasting life. And make me a better person. I now open my heart to receive God's word. Amen and amen. We live in an age that is often called the information age. Because today there is a virtual information explosion around the world. And I guess one of the main reasons, or some of the main reasons, are a television and the internet, where people are continually bombarded with information. And people will sit for night after night in front of a computer, just, just watching and absorbing information. And they've got all sorts of bits of trivia that they, they become authorities on, but the question is, to so much of this, this is the question, who cares? Because information is not wisdom. And even though the world has got heaps and heaps of information such as people never dreamed possible, the sad thing is this, so often people's heads are full, but their hearts are empty. So you've got full heads, empty hearts. I tell you, my friend, this meeting today is going to give us full heads, but it's also going to give us full hearts. And we're going to discover today the way to life. The topic today is the truth that saves. The truth that saves. Today we're going to attempt the impossible. We're going to try to get an ocean and put it in a thimble. Trying to collect the ocean and put it in a thimble. We're going to look at a book that was written by a great Jewish scholar to people who were living in the days of the Caesars. And they were living in the capital of the Roman Empire. This book is called today Romans. Now, I would venture to say to you today that even though people have got lots and lots of information about lots and lots of things, and you may be like that, I may be like that, most folks have got no idea at all about the truths that are taught in the book of Romans. Let me say this to my American brothers and sisters, my friends in this great land of liberty and freedom. But for the book of Romans, there would not have been an America. You say, well, that's absurd. No, it's not absurd. 
Because if you go back a few hundred years, you go back to Germany, and you go back to a Roman Catholic monk whose name was, who was it? Martin Luther. And Martin Luther discovered the truth of salvation from the book of Romans. If there had been no Protestant Reformation, there would have been no America, no Great Britain, and no democracies. Because everything before the Protestant Reformation was the Dark Ages. That's what historians call it, the Dark Ages. A big church and a big government and absolutely no freedoms. And then there came a man sent from God whose name was Martin Luther and he discovered the truth of the book of Romans. And if there's any information that you and I ought to have today and understand, it is the truth from the book of Romans. Now if those who are watching the telecast today and members of my congregation... And I want to say to those who are viewing today in Southern California, my church is at 100 West Duarte Road, Arcadia, California. You can call my office Mondays to Fridays on, uh, let me think, 626-254-0898, and you can get directions to come to my church. And I want you to come. But I've got something here that I passed out to some of my friends and my church members. In fact, this has been translated into Russian and placed in the hands of every Russian and Ukrainian pastor of our denomination. And they say it is making a tremendous impact. It is based on the book of Romans, the big issues of the gospel. You say, well, everybody understands the gospel. I want to say to you today, probably not one person in ten who goes to our church understands the gospel. I didn't always understand the gospel. But God has revealed the gospel to me. And I've written it down in this little booklet, The Big Issues of the Gospel. And if you'd like to have it, then write to me. Or better still, come and see me at my church. I want to tell you something. The book of Romans can do marvelous things for you. This book will not only give you a full head of vital information, it'll give you a full heart. Good day, said. This, the great philosopher said, good day. This is the greatest masterpiece that the human mind has ever conceived or realized. Tyndale, the great British reformer said, it's good, glad and merry tidings that makes a man's heart to sing for joy and his feet to dance. Gloomy, unhappy Christians are a bad advertisement for their Lord. Good, glad, and merry tidings that makes a man's heart to sing for joy and his feet to dance. Martin Luther said, this is the chief part of the New Testament and the most perfect gospel. That is the book of Romans. The book of Romans is an incomprehensible mystery to most people. And they read it and they say, it is too hard to think. Did you know there is a sinister satanic plot in the world today to stop God's people from studying the book of Romans and from thinking? But here today, we are going to attempt the impossible mission, impossible, to capture the sea in a thimble. 
in the next 30 minutes or so. Please open your Bible to the good, glad, and merry tidings. Romans uh, chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, Paulos. This is our Roman name, Paulos. A servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. This book is about the gospel of God and the gospel is never about me. It is never the gospel of the church, the gospel of John Carter. It is the gospel of God. Salvation is not centered in people. It is centered in God. It is the gospel of God. That's what the Bible says. It is not the gospel of man. It is the gospel of God. But beware, you may believe the gospel of man. Verses 2 to 4. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. The man who writes these words is a Jew. If a man is anti-Semitic, he is no disciple of Christ. We owe almost, no, we owe everything under God to the Jews. The Bible, the prophets, the apostles, the Messiah. Jesus was a Jew. Once I preached a sermon like this, and a man, complete racist, called me up and abused me. He said, Jesus was not a Jew. It is a lie. Jesus was a Jew. It is the teaching of scripture. And Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. My beloved friends in the Jewish community have no need of feeling threatened by Jesus because he is one of you. He fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is our Lord. Verse 16 says, we're going to try to capture the scene a thimble. Notice the texts. If you don't turn my congregational members, my members of my congregation to the texts, you are going to be lost. Turn to the texts. And if you think you know this today, the odds are you do not. Verse 16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. You know, I am tremendously interested in astronomy. My son said to me the other day, I was proud of him when he said it. He said, if I were starting out again, I think I would be an astronomer because of the wonder, the marvels, the bigness. The greatness of God, the power of God in making a billion trillion blazing suns, the power that made the universe is now directed to us through the gospel. The gospel is the power of God. Listen to me carefully. Satan today would put you to sleep. Did you know that most of us here have been terribly brainwashed by our culture? People watch 30, 40 hours of television a week, read novels, and they become brain uh, damaged. Some brain dead. Therefore, they cannot concentrate for more than a 30 second period. This is how Satan would have it be so that we would be lost. The gospel is the power of God 
power to change your life, overcome your problems, forgive sins, take the hate out of our hearts and put love there, take the anger out and give us peace. Now Romans chapter 1, now this book was not thrown together in 10 minutes. It is written like a lawyer's brief. It is complex and absolutely logical. And the first chapter deals with the sins of the Gentile world. The sins of the world outside the church, the unbelievers, the Gentiles. So of course a Gentile in the New Testament is anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus the Messiah. Notice verse 24 and onwards it describes the sins of the unchurched. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who was forever praised. Amen. Because of this God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. We know it has a name, has it not? In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. It has a name, does it not? Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They had become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but also approve of those who practice them. These are the sins of the ancient Roman Empire. These are the sins of Los Angeles. These are the sins of the United States of America. These are the sins of Australia. These are the sins of the world outside the church. These are the sins of the Hollywood sitcoms who are prepared to display all of these sins but will not show the movie The Passion of Christ. He still worries them, doesn't he? He still scares them. They'll show any of these sins, but they will not show The Passion of Christ. They are still terrified of him in Hollywood. And they are described here in these verses. The Romans 2 passes from the world of the churched, the unchurched, to the world of religion. Verses 21 to 24, Romans 2. Romans 1, the Gentiles. Romans 2, the Jews and the believers. Verse 17, now you, if you call yourself a Jew. We could say today, if you call yourself a believer. Verse 21 and onwards. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. If Paul were preaching in our context today, the first chapter he would have addressed would have been to Hollywood or Washington or Sydney or Moscow. But this chapter he would have addressed to the church. 
And he says, you think you're better? He says, in fact, you are no better. The greatest crimes against humanity have been committed not by the people of Hollywood, but by the people of churches and mosques and synagogues. Jesus was crucified by religious people and so-called Christians ran the Inquisition. Today, around the world, every major conflict is carried out by religious people. Romans 1, the Bible says, Romans 1. The unbelievers are lost. Romans 2, it says, the believers are no better. Can you understand why this is not preached in churches? Or in Hollywood. In Romans 3, he comes now to the great summing up of these first chapters. Romans 3, 9 and 10. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin as it is written. There is no one righteous, not even one. So when you get to Romans 3, Paul, the Jewish theologian, says all religious and non-religious are lost. All abound in the prison house of sin and the law is the jailer and he has thrown away the key. Did you get that, what I said? All abound in the prison house of sin and the law is the jailer. Oh, he's not the savior. The law is the jailer and he's thrown away the key. Verse 19 is a bitter pill to swallow. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, it has been said, all alike are sinners, but not all are sinners alike. Some would never commit adultery, but oh, they're cold and critical. They would never steal, but they gossip. All abound in the prison house of sin. And then in Romans chapter 3, so you can see, my friend, we can never do anything of ourselves to save ourselves. Romans 3, 21 to 26. And uh, it has been said, and I agree with the statement, it has been said that these verses ignored by 99% of us are the high pinnacle, the Everest of Scripture. Now you won't understand them unless the Spirit of God opens your eyes and mine. Pray God that we will have a revelation. Verse 21. But now our righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he'd left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And you say, Pastor Carter, tell us a story. Give us a 30-second commercial. 
Now, I'm going to ask, have you got the microphone there, Blake? Okay, you got it now. Mr. Blake Wexler, who came to our church and is our Jewish brother, I say, glory be to God in Christ. And he is going to read to you this passage that is found in the book that is called The Message. I would remind you this is a paraphrase, not a translation, but it somehow gets the spirit of the passage. Listen as my brother Blake reads it to you. From Holy Scripture, the words of the great Jewish scholar, the greatest Jew in the history of the world, with the exception of our Lord, St. Paul. God has set things right, but in our time, something has been added. What Moses and the prophets witnessed to all those years has happened. The God setting things right that we've read about has become Yeshua, or Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. For there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we've compiled this long and sorry record of sinners, both us and them, we provided, we've proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us. God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself. A pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear that world of sin. Having faith in him sets us in the clear. God decided on this course of action in full view of public to set the world in clear with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus, finally taking care of the sins he had so patiently endured. This is not only clear, but it's now. This is current history. God sets things right. He also makes it possible for us to live in his rightness. So where does that leave our proud Jewish insider claims and counterclaims? Canceled. Yes, canceled. What we've learned is this. God does not respond to what we do. We respond to what God does. Amen. We finally figured it out. Our lives get in step with God and all others by letting him set the pace, not by proudly or anxiously trying to run the parade. And where does that leave our proud Jewish claim of having a corner on God, also canceled? God is the God of outsider non-Jews as well as insider Jews. How could it be otherwise since there is only one God? God sets right all who welcome his action and enter into it both those who follow our religious system and those who have ever heard of our religion. Fortunate those crimes are carted off, whose sins are wiped clean from the slate. Fortunate the person against whom the Lord does not keep score. Amen. Fortunate. Amen. God bless you, Blake. Thank you, my brother. Listen, if by the grace of God, I can portray this. This is the truth that changes the world. It is the truth that saves the world. We've all sinned. We are all sinners. Salvation is not found in us or in what we do. It is found in what Christ did for us on the cross when he bled and died for our sins. Now, if we come to him in true faith, in true faith as penitence, he forgives and justifies and changes the heart of man. What is so hard for you and for me is to recognize that we are sinners. Oh, it's okay with the people next door. 
or the Gentiles or the Muslims. We are sinners. When this truth dawns in our souls, the old root of the Pharisee is destroyed. So as Blake read from the message, it doesn't depend upon our strength in running the parade. It depends upon what Christ did for us. Listen to me. This truth is revealed by the Holy Spirit. I've had pastors who've been pastors for 40 years tell me I didn't know it. What a pastor I was. 40 years preaching what I thought was the gospel. Damning souls! All of a sudden, a man came and he preached and my eyes were opened. God have mercy on what I've done. This is revealed by the Spirit that we are great sinners, but he is a great Savior. Amen. When we see him, then we start to see us as we really are. This is the truth that changes the world. Now, the Jewish people back there said we can't believe Paul because he's preaching against the Old Testament. He's preaching the new theology. Look at Romans 4, he says. What then shall we say that Abraham our forefather discovered in this matter? Verse 3. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. It was credited, credited to him as righteousness. He did not earn it. It was given as a gift. And then verse 6, David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. I want to say to every person watching the telecast, David was a great sinner like you, like me. But the Bible tells us that there is great hope for great sinners because Jesus is a great Savior. And David believed in the Lord with a penitent heart and it was counted unto him as righteousness. And where does this lead me to? Romans chapter 5, which is the chapter on the two Adams. Therefore, verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You get peace with God and peace with yourself and peace with others when you have peace with the Father through Jesus. He is the only way to peace. Look at verse 12. You see, we're trying to compress the sea into a thimble. Look at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sin. People say, well, I am only a sinner when I grow up. The Bible says, we all sinned in Adam. That is the teaching of the Bible and the teaching of the church. Adam was the representative of the human race and we're lost in Adam. People say, I really do not want to believe this. My friend, put away your sinful unbelief and believe the Bible. Look at verse 19. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. So the Bible says we're not winners because we're the first past the finishing pole. We're not winners because of our success in the race. 
We are winners because somebody ran the race for us. And that was Jesus. Everything, we, everything was lost in Adam, my friend. Everything. You were lost in Adam. No, you say, I, I cannot believe that I was lost in Adam, my friend. Stop trying to believe me and believe the Bible. In Adam all die, it says. Through one man sin entered the world and death by sin. Why do people die? It is because we are under sin. Then Jesus came, and everything Adam lost, Jesus won. And if you're in Jesus, you're considered to be a winner, and you've run the race, and you're home, and you're saved. That's why it's called good news. You say, like, oh, I can't believe this. Well, believe, or else you'll perish. Now, someone says, but this could lead to antinomianism. Well, you're not the first person who said that. Somebody said that to Paul. Look at Romans 6 and verse 1. Here's the next chapter that deals with antinomianism, which is the attitude that you don't need to keep God's commandments. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. And uh, I want you to notice another verse here, please. Verse 11 and 12. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. And uh, verse 8 says, For if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. That was a verse I could not understand as a young man. If we died with Christ... I understand it. Why do I understand it? Because I put aside my pride and I believed just what God said. The Bible says in Corinthians, if one died for all, then all died. I am crucified with Christ. What does it mean? It means this, that when Jesus died... I was there. When Adam sinned, I was in Adam. You, you weren't in Adam. Well, where do you think you were? Where do you think you came from? Some monkeys? We came from Adam. We were literally in Adam. We were there. Where did we come from? We were in Adam. And when he sinned, we sinned. Lost. You say, who else believes this? Oh, my friend, the whole of the Protestant Reformation. This is also the teaching of my church. You say, I don't believe it. Well, you don't even believe what your own church teaches. Get the book on the 27 fundamentals. And when Jesus conquered, when he died on the cross, and when he was judged for the sin of the world, I was in Christ. And when he died, as far as the law of God is concerned, I died. And in Christ, I paid the penalty. And the law can no longer condemn a man who has paid the penalty and who is dead. So legally, I'm dead. But Jesus was raised from the dead. Legally, I've been raised. And therefore, all the glory is to God. And therefore, Paul says, this happened legally, now put it into practice and consider yourselves dead to sin and do not walk in the ways of the Gentiles any longer. Chapter 7. A most misunderstood chapter because people don't like to believe the Bible. Let me tell you, there are two interpretations of this chapter. The interpretation of our friends, the Jesuits, who teach that the person described in Romans 7 is an unconverted man. Remember this? When people say, this is not Paul the converted man, 
This is Paul, the unconverted man. Thank you. That's what the Jesuits teach. That's why they oppose Martin Luther. Martin Luther and the Protestant reformers said, Romans 7 is not the unconverted Paul. It is Paul the Christian who has received a revelation of himself that he doesn't like. Romans 7 verse 9. If you come to this church, you may receive a revelation that you don't like, but it may save you. Verse 9. Once I was alive apart from the law, when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. Oh, he was once a very fine fellow, absolutely perfect, making no mistakes. That's when he was a Pharisee. But then he had a revelation of Christ. He saw himself as he was. How did he see himself? As a stinking sinner. Have you seen yourself as a stinking sinner? Then he comes down to verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Soul is a slave to sin. Verse 24. What a wretched man I am. So the Jesuit says, this can be. And the Jesuits are perfectionists. They say, this cannot be Paul, the conqueror, because he was a perfect man. The Jesuits never read, apparently, Revelation 3 that describes the remnant church of the last days. The remnant church of the last days that has a good dose of Pharisaism says this, I am rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. Look at my great success, my holiness. I am better than everybody else. That's the religion of the Pharisee. But the religion of the Bible says, oh, wretched man that I am. Do you feel that? When you and I feel that we're wretched, and were we, wonderful lady said, the closer we come to Christ, the more sinful we'll appear. I took the meetings in 1988 at the Minneapolis General Conference, 100 years after 1888. As I went into the meeting one night, it was snowing, and there were some people gathered around a 44-gallon drum passing out literature. And one man said to me, take this literature and you'll become sinless. I said, like you? He said, yes. <laughs> yes. And the man standing, he said, we have attained. Uh, that's the voice of Laodicea. I have needed nothing. But the voice of the apostle is, oh, wretched man that I am. When you and I understand our weakness, our failings, our sinfulness will be easier to get along with and we won't be so bombastic and so self-righteous and so judgmental and so unforgiving. A person who is wounded makes a good doctor. Martin Luther said a Christian is always a sinner, always a penitent, always right with God. That passage is never understood by the Jesuits. Always a sinner, teaching Antinope. No, no, no. A Christian knows his weakness. He knows his failings. He knows he doesn't have the love in his heart that he ought to have. He knows he's stumbling. And he's always a penitent because he's always saying, God help me to do better. It's a terrible thing, my friend, if you've got a church full of people who never make mistakes. And there are churches like that. That's why they're fighting all the time. That's why they want to climb up over somebody else's body to be the head elder. Or the top gun in the general conference. Or the conference, or the union. The pastor wants to be the pastor of the church. Hey, here it is. Take it. <laughs> Can you do it? Oh, wretched man that I am. 
the person who cries out, oh, wretched man that I am, is a child of God. Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you're under the blood, you're not condemned. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. The righteous requirements of the law are fully met in the man who trusts in Christ. And that man then will not walk after the sinful nature. A wonderful change takes place in the life. The proud become humble. Who are the proudest people in the world? Religious people, on the whole. The proud become humble. The selfish become generous. Who are some of the most selfish people in the world? Religious people. The selfish become generous. The drunken become sober. The gluttons become temperate. The hating become loving. The bitter become sweet. The revengeful become forgiving. This is the truth that saves anything less is a delusion. Dr. Bert Roger, who was a dear member of our church with his wonderful wife, Elfie, is going to come and read to you a passage from Romans. Out of the message. Listen to the words. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of us? <clears throat> Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised in life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, no, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Amen. 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 Amen.